Welcome to Trifecta Collective, Finding the Root with Megan and Shannon, the podcast where we dive deep into all things health and wellness to help you find health and healing inside and out for now and forever. Hello and welcome to Trifecta Collective, Finding the Root with Megan and Shannon. I am Megan Abbott, owner and founder of the Holistic Health Practice Trifecta Collective, and this is my co-host and head practitioner, Shannon Howard. Welcome to the podcast. Hello, how's it going today? Yeah, it's going super good. Today we're doing a, a one of many follow-up episodes that we will be recording here, and this is Gut Health Part 2. Uh, I know we, we've done a lot of topics here recently that require some extra time, but that's important because they're such big topics. So today we're going to kind of wrap up the whole gut health and, and how do we heal the gut and what does this look like? And, and uh, we're going to talk about some testing today. We're going to talk about stool testing and all of our thoughts around stool testing. And, and then uh, mo- most importantly, <laughs> How do we heal the gut? You know, like, what does this really look like? And, and what are other things that impact the gut? And, and how do we actually go about healing the gut so we don't end up with recurrent issues like so many of us, you and I both fall into this category, these, these recurrent yeah. issues that we end up with. So how do we make sure that doesn't happen? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And we, for part one of this, if you haven't listened to it, highly suggest going back and starting with that one because we dive really deep into just a lot of topics that are leading up to what we're about to talk about today and we did we ended with food sensitivity testing last time which i know people probably would love to hear all of our thoughts around that so that was really a really good episode so i do recommend going back and listening to it um today we are going to start with stool testing though yeah this is Stool testing is very, uh, it's not our favorite. I'll, I'll start with that. It's definitely not our favorite way to test. But, you know, there's there's so many other good tests out there. Like blood work is, we've, we've talked about this many times before, a really good starting point. We can see a lot of different patterns throughout there. There's other functional testing like the organic acids tests, which we have also talked about that on one of our podcast episodes. Stool testing is just... It's very hit or miss in everything that we would hope to see, like parasites, bacteria. I feel like the stool testing is most often recommended for testing for parasites and like, you know, general gut dysbiosis in bacteria. Megan's shaking your head if you can't see the video because we know that it's really, really hard to test for parasites through stool testing. Yeah. And here, so the overarching theme of today is just because you have gut issues doesn't mean it's all about the gut. And we really need to take a bigger look, a deeper look at what is really going on? Why is it going on? What are all of the things that are impacting the gut? And I, you know, there's so many people out there in the holistic health world that are die hard, be all, end all. It is only the gut. It, as long as we fix and heal the gut, and they often use elimination diets and pretty significant killing protocols without sometimes without the rebuilding part of it which we'll get into today and i just you know you and i have experienced working with these types of practitioners and i i mean in my own healing journey i took five stools which is five too many four we'll say four it is four too many and some of them came back and looks great. And they were like, we're fine. You're good because the gut is good. And my gut was still not good. I was still having bloating and constipation and food sensitivities and all of these things. And stool testing is just so limited, which is why we very, 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 very rarely ever recommend it. And here's the thing. So... From a bacteria standpoint, yeah, it it, it can be value, valuable in showing us different bacterial overgrowths, different types of beneficial bacteria that may be present, may be present too much or too little. 
Uh, we get a little bit of a look at the immune system, although it's it's very generalized. The way stool testing looks at the immune system when it comes to yeast and fungal issues, and I can't quite remember if we how much we touched on this in the last episode, but it takes a long time for yeast and fungal issues to show up in stool. Uh, they show up in urine much, much, much faster, which is why we prefer the organic when it comes to yeast and fungal issues and you know our stories it's really interesting you know they have the you know multiple days of stool testing there's the one off stool testing but our stool is also it's different it's different most of the time when we go and so we're seeing different things come out it is a little bit different with urine with saliva and with even with blood work, you know, it, it is different and everything has their strengths and their weaknesses. And just with stool testing, our biggest problem with it is it's so focused on just the gut and really heavily focused on the bacteria portion, which, yes, is important. And it is not the be all end all when it comes to the gut and just our overall health and wellness. And I think that's really important to understand that, yeah, the gut is super important. And there are so, so, so many things that impact the gut. And if we only look at the gut and only look at what our bacteria, what our, our gut flora looks like, we're missing so many things. And I know, you know, and it does depend a little bit on what stool testing you've done, like the gut zoomer versus the GI map. Those are a little bit different. You know, some show like different, you know, digestive enzymes and where those are, which, yes, once again, important information. And if we're not producing these things, why? Why does it, why are we not doing that? And our biggest, you know, once again, like, and I, I feel like I just said this, but one of our biggest problems is <laughs> with this tool testing is we're not getting any of those answers as to why. Like, why and how did this happen? And the stool test leaves us hanging with with those answers and that's our biggest problem with it and it's i you know for me if you're gonna spend 200 i don't i don't know what stool test is 200 dollars, but if you're spending 200 to 800 dollars realistically i mean i have seen them for over a thousand two uh on a oh stool, yeah exactly on a stool test you're honestly you're wasting your money uh, there, there's so much other testing that you could be doing. And I think, you know, once again, I'm not going to say the name of this company because uh, they're very big in this space, but they, I'm in some groups with them and all of their practitioners and just the test they recommend is a stool test all of the time. And it's like $500. And I've done that. I've done theirs. I've done the protocol. Uh, you have healing and rebuilding protocols. And they're pretty garbage. They're pretty garbage. And they don't focus on the correct things. And, and this is just a huge mistake. And this is why people end up with so many recurrent gut issues. I spend so much time, so much money. That's honestly wasted. And once again, we fall into this category. I'm not just like blaming other people. Yeah. We did this too. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. I, I think I have taken like two or three stool tests. And I mean, that that's your answer right there. Like, if you want to re, honestly, a stool test would probably be beneficial if you wanted to spend extra money on testing at the end of the program to see how much good bacteria you have. That would be a really great time to use it. But at that point, you know, no one wants to spend that much more money on a test when we're already done healing. So but yeah, I mean, if you're if you're having to take this test over multiple times like we were, that right there tells you that you're not getting the the most accurate results from it because you would have been healing the issues the first time. <laughs> so yeah, stool stool testing is not our favorite form of testing to use by by any means. We much prefer like an oat test or blood work as a starting point. Um and again, too, with blood work, like we can see bacteria trends within your blood work and it's much more affordable as well. Great place to start for tests. But it, we're we're missing these other things. So when we start to talk about like, so, yes, you have some sort of gut dysbiosis going on. Maybe you have a bacterial imbalance going on in your gut. 
So then we have to start to ask ourselves, well, why? Why did that happen? What what went wrong throughout the process in my body to where I can't process this out as normal and move on with my day? And that's the part that we're not going to get that answer from that stool test. So, you know, and that's where this other testing, like like I said, we can see some of the stuff in blood work. We can definitely see it show up in an O test. We can get tons of information from the O test as far as like, you know, heavy metals, some bacterial, fungal stuff, mold, so much from that test. And those are the big things. Those are the root and the why behind why your gut couldn't handle that bacteria in the first place. We have to see like, you know, is there parasites going on? Do, do you have heavy metals? Is there mold involved? Are you in an active like viral flare right now? There's Those are the bigger things underneath that we actually need to see and look out for. Exactly. And, you know, just one other thing, I, you know, I'm just like remembering what all, you know, everything that comes up in a stool test. H. pylori is another one. I just want to make sure we're trying to get everything in there and address all the questions here as best we can. Yep. You know, H. pylori will show up uh, on in a stool test oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes also, once again, depends on what stool test you choose to use. But once again, H. pylori, you know, H. pylori is a symptom. It is not a root cause. And cool, that's great information. And when we go in and do work around bacteria, yeast, fungus, and parasites, specifically in the gut, you know, one of the products that we use from self Care here too, it is killing... H. pylori, SIBO, C. diff, yeast issues, fungal issues, candida overgrowth issues, all of these things. You know, and once again, I, I can't quite remember if we, how much we dove into this in the first part of gut health, but, you know, I, I think a really important thing to understand too with any of these overgrowth issues, and I know we definitely talked about this on the Thursday episode, is all of these things exist in our body. You know, we, we have okay. bacteria, all kinds of bacteria. We should have all kinds of bacteria in our body. Same thing. We, we should have all kinds of yeast in our body and, and some fungal stuff in our body and parasites in our body. And it's the real question is when we have these overgrowth issues, the question is why and how did this happen? There were checks and balances that our body had to keep all of these things where they're supposed to be and in the amount they're supposed to be. And when we end up, when they end up in a place they're not supposed to be, like in our small intestine with SIBO, or in an amount that's overwhelming for our body, like with parasites, you know, parasite overgrowth, a candida overgrowth, that's when the issue really comes into play where these things have now shifted and moved and grown to a point where our body cannot handle them. And once again, if we just go in and kill and, and do this killing work, of course, <laughs> Or we then we then reestablish those checks and balances as to how and why they got there in the first place. You know, the other thing with parasites mm -hmm. is, you know, with with parasites, and if you are interested in this, go back to our parasite episode. We do a real deep dive into this. Parasites mm -hmm. are very, very sneaky. You know, you can do there's all kinds of direct blood tests, you know, like for a ringworm and all these things. And and then there you can do a parasite section on a lot of stool testing you can add that on or, or certain ones will have it some won't really hard to find uh, all of five of my stool tests never showed parasites and i had a massive parasite problem and when i went back and started looking at all of my blood work the cdc with differential specifically the relationship between the monocytes eosinophils and basophils the parasite pattern was there from start and and only got worse as I went along. And when I was doing parasite work, when when I was doing parasite work properly and had done the prep work to do it and did dosages that were appropriate for my body, not, I mean, many 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 parasites came out of I came out of my body. And every once in a while, anytime I do a full moon protocol, I'll sometimes get that. It's not very often, but. Yeah, it was a really serious problem for me that went un unseen, unknown. And that's because many practitioners are just not trained in in understanding the hows and the whys. And once again, I, I'm trained in stool testing. Uh, you know, the gut zoomer and GI map are the two that if if we are going to recommend stool testing, those are the two. Um, and it kind of depends on the person and also how much they would like to pay, uh, which 
<laughs> which one we'd recommend. But, you know, one of the things that was the biggest issue that I had, once again, of these things not covered in any of these trainings was, okay, these things are present. Here's a protocol to address it. But once again, it's it's this bigger picture of how and why did this happen in the first place? And so if you are working with a practitioner, if you suspect you haven't made these issues, ask them. Ask them what mm-hmm. they think, what their interpretation, what their thoughts are, what their feedback is. Ask you how and why this got there and how it, what are what is going to be done in your protocol to make sure it's not coming back. And it's just, and there are plenty of other practitioners who think very similar to we do and, and and thinking about the bigger picture and, and the physiology and the house and the lives and, you know, really, really digging into all the puzzle pieces here. But they were just really good questions to ask if you are going to work with someone. Once again, as someone, as people who have worked with many practitioners who did not think this way. And then we had to figure it out ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, same thing for me. Like, I- looking back on all my blood work once I went through all this training and I'm like, oh my God, these parasites were like intense patterns and they've been here the entire time and just no one knew how to point it out. And they didn't show up in stool tests. So it was immediately ruled out. And like, I had all the other things that went with it, like horrible sensitivities, digestion issues, like all these things and it was just missed. And, and I will say too, because they are so sneaky by all means, like when I look at someone's blood work and they're presenting with like GI issues or maybe not that intense of GI issues, and we don't, we might not see like a really strong parasite pattern. But if there's, you know, if there's other things going on, like I said, digestion issues and whatnot, we are most likely still going to address parasites because they are so, so sneaky. And I mean, I, we haven't had any I'm trying to think if we've had like a single client that has not said like, hey, I didn't see anything in my stool the entire time. You know what I mean? Like that's just not it. It's not common to not have parasites go along with issues when we because it's like that it's that co-infection piece. And I know we've talked about this before. There's just always something bigger going on in the body and it's so easily missed. And that's the part that we are really, really focused on figuring out. So we can address the entire issue and do the rebuilding and hopefully make it so you don't have to deal with the SIBO, the bacteria, whatever you may be dealing with again. And there's also another really big part to this, too, which we have talked about numerous times again, but it's that nervous system piece like that. It's it's such a big piece here. We can do all the supplement work that we want to try and clear out the gut, heal it, build it back up, put it together. If we can't get our nervous system regulated during that time or even start to work on it, it's going to make everything very difficult and probably really hard to to get you to the the place that you desire to be at. Exactly. I just had something else pop up, but, you know, maybe one last thing before we move on to like the more stereotypical five phases of gut healing. And that is, there is a trend going on right now. I don't, it's, I don't think it's a huge trend, but I have seen it and I am aware of it on social media, specifically on TikTok is where I've mostly seen this, of anemia issues being blamed on SIBO. And oh. well, I think there is some validity to gut issues and anemia issues, which are also anemia is another very complicated topic. Be sure to stay tuned for our blood work part two. We will touch on this and then we'll probably also do a whole other episode on anemia and just iron in general. And I will say more often, and correct me if I'm wrong, Shannon, I'd say more often than not, if someone is presenting with chronic anemia issues, almost always parasites are playing a massive role here uh, in, in various types. There's also not one type of it you're not just anemic there are there are also varying degrees and levels and, and reasons and types of anemia and so it's really important to understand that which most of these people who i have seen are not uh, do not seem to be well trained and well versed in that 
And they, they're just blaming these bacterial overgrowths uh, as, as to the mm-hmm. quote unquote root cause of, of anemia, which once again, there, there's various forms of anemia. But I just think that it is important to address just because I have seen that trend that, that it's more often parasites than actual bacteria issues. Once again, not saying bacteria overgrowth issues aren't present because yeah, they definitely could be and they commonly are. So definitely things to look out for. And once again, understanding, okay, uh, it's not that simple when it comes to anemia. One, two, bacteria overgrowth alone are not going to just like randomly cause anemia. There's going to be some some bigger reasons why and once again, why and how uh, that anemia got there in the first place and also why and how the bacterial overgrowth got there in the first place. Yeah, I have not seen this trend, but in just to throw this out there too, which I'm sure we're going to talk about this when we do blood work part two, but I know a lot of people think that iron deficiency and anemia are the same thing and they are absolutely not. Two totally different things. So I just wanted to mention that. And if you hear that, you can certainly go and look it up, but we'll talk about it um, in a couple of weeks when we record blood, uh, blood work part two. But yeah, there's anemia is complex like megan was saying there's different versions of it most likely parasites are involved and you know they steal so many nutrients and whatnot it's yeah it's a it's a much bigger thing than that and it's helpful to see some testing around that too because that's also going to help us decipher like what type of anemia is going on exactly and how do we support the body and and getting it what it's which may or may not actually be iron yeah yep could be, yeah. Very closely related, but not the same thing. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. So, be- before we move into the five R's uh, of gut healing, you know, just, and I and I think we've mentioned this, but I think it's worthwhile to just, like, throw this list out there. So, if you do have dysbiosis issues, which means just, like, general gut issues and balances, gut imbalances. If you're experiencing a lot of gut issues, big things to look for as far as like bigger root causes. Pops and overload. Mold. Heavy metals are two of the biggest ones. Certainly we we will want to look at environmental toxins because they can play a role too. But mold and heavy metals are two of the biggest ones. Parasites, uh, which we've talked about and parasites, mm-hmm. we also need to look once again like, okay, well what how did the parasites get there in the first place too? Uh, you know, viral issues, we want to look at the immune system overall, what's going on with the immune system may or may not be a root cause, but certainly worthwhile to look for. And then everything we've listed in part one, when we talked about like north to south digestion and everything that comes before we even get to the small intestine. And then also, you know, as Shannon said, the nervous system. If, if you are in a constant state of fight, flight, freeze, you're never going to have great digestion. Your things are going to go wrong because the body is not meant to properly digest food. When we are in this sympathetic state, we need to be in a parasympathetic rest and digest kind of state. And once again, it's not about being there all of the time, but being able to get back there uh, when when we need to, to be able to properly digest, absorb our food and nutrients and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And this is, I mean, even as a maintenance piece, this is is so huge. Like, for example, in my personal life, I know if I'm really stressed out, maybe going through some big changes or whatnot, I'm going to need to give my digestion better support. I'm going to need to slow down and check in with myself before I eat. Because if I don't, I will feel like I'm having some sort of flare up if I try and eat when I'm really stressed. And this is like, it's so common across the board for a lot of people, especially if you've dealt with digestion issues, this nervous system piece and just being able to pay attention and implement like the whole process of slowing down is going to be so helpful for during the detox process and during the maintenance process. Yes. And I will say the more and more I regulate my nervous system, the better my digestion it's even even if I'm like yeah. my digestion it feels good there's no bloating you know stools are good happening every day one you know one to three times a day and you know everything is good just even just the more regulated I am and once again you know this year has been a big year for me and, and I'm way more regulated than I've ever been and it show I mean my digestion 
show is that. And not once again, not to say it's been perfect the entire time. There's been a lot of travel and, and stress and lots of change. And I, you know, some things that I always have something in case I get constipated. And then I also always have like starting some support. You know, those are the two things from a digestion standpoint that I always have on hand as a just in case tools. But the nervous system piece, I think, is really undervalued when it comes to the gut issues and really it is the the safer you can feel in your body the way better way 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 better your digestion's gonna be mm-hmm. yeah you'll always catch me with those two things when i'm traveling yeah. <laughs> maybe a little bit of liver support too yeah. <laughs> yes. uh, that is also always on hand you know i always have a binder you know the, quite a few things but yeah the, those are always yeah. always good tools to have on hand here so all right. Well, let's yeah. move in. Let's move into the five R's um, of of gut healing, and these are pretty widely accepted. And we're going to show talk more about each one, and also how we do it a little different. Uh, you know, like yeah, <laughs> like we do with just about everything else. We have a little bit of our own system, and we have we yeah, just concerns and issues with some of these steps uh and, and how they're often presented and and we'll, we'll talk yeah so i'm going to go through these i think i'm going to go through as the list s- displays itself and because we do do things like in quite a bit different of order we'll we'll jump into that after i go through them so uh, the 5 r's this is a pretty wide widely known saying i would say right this isn't just from michael's course okay good i was like refresh my memory (laughs) so the first one is going to be remove and when we think about removing things we megan has talked a lot a lot in the past about like the stress bucket so our body you know it's kind of like a stress bucket so we want to start to take things out that are putting more stress on it this can look like inflammatory foods that we're eating it can look like starting to address some of the the deeper rooted issues like pathogens for example you know mold bacteria all the things that's like that's the first phase um we it it's like it's hit or miss we definitely want to start to remove some of these things but that's not always the case like we really try and meet people where they're at and sometimes not everyone is ready to take a bunch of stuff out of their lifestyle, remove all these foods. That That's just not what we found to be the most efficient for everyone. Um, I know I said I was going to talk about this at the end, but it makes makes more sense to do it now, I think. Um, so typically our first, our first step is going to be working on opening up the drainage pathways, which we've talked about numerous times. We have a whole podcast episode about it. So that's always our initial step before we go in and start to remove any of the pathogens. And this is super, super, super important because if you go straight into killing and if you've been put on meds for usually SIBO or H. pylori, this is going to apply more than like yeast, fungal, parasite issues, although I have seen people be put on meds for those too. But you can get really sick. Same thing with herbal protocols. If you go straight into like oil of oregano and, you know, some of these things, you can get really sick and have a lot of die off symptoms. You know, for me, when I started on my very first protocol, it was like removing all of the things nutritionally and going into killing all at once. And I, the best way I can describe it is like coming off of drugs. And, and literally mm-hmm. that kind, that level of illness, I mean, like a flu, super nauseous, couldn't eat, couldn't drink anything. I was super tired, but didn't sleep. I mean, if it was here and it was two weeks, I, I went through this. I also dropped weight very quickly on that and in not a good way. And, you know, just, I felt so, so awful. I mean, I was shaky, you know, tremors were happening yeah really i mean it was really like a clinical detox that i should not have been put through and i went you know it was a really strict elimination i and i was on i don't know 18 to 25 supplements all at once that all happened all together which is mind-blowing to to us now 
But I, you know, I d- didn't know anything. That was, you know, the first, this is what my practitioner said. And I trusted him and he was really smart. And I still think he's really smart. And I don't think that's the right way to do things. So, you know, yeah. um, the other thing, you know, if you've listened to many of our other episodes, we do have a lot of hesitation in putting people on strict elimination diets. And for a lot of reasons, the first being mental and emotional. Uh, people can get a lot of food fears. It can be done for too long. Uh, it can not be good for the body. It can, you can detox just from an elim- elimination diet. It's just very stressful. And our whole goal during this process of, of helping people heal is to reduce stress inside and outside of the body. That stress bucket. Like, how do we take things out of that bucket so we have more room? And an elimination diet for most people, not for all people, but for most people, that actually adds something to their bucket uh, and can add things in a very big way that can be very too much, too much for the body. So that that is why we, by and large, do not use elimination diets. We are thoroughly trained in how to do them. We've done almost all of them uh, and spent many uh-huh. years on them and so we're you know we will use them as needed but they are not needed for the vast majority of people and so when we think about removing it's it's you know it's almost like we do the opposite of we add something. uh you know we add in you know can we add in more protein and and we'll talk about this in in a later episode too when we dive deeper into this in one of my our upcoming episodes here but You know, protein is so important and so underutilized, and it's also a really sneaky way to limit carbs, maybe not the best source of carbs and sugars. And so just increasing protein will decrease those cravings. And so that's a huge thing that we want. You know, certainly we will talk about, you know, can we swap swap out inflammatory oils? Like if someone's eating a ton of processed foods, can we add some more whole foods in there and maybe remove some of that processed foods? And we'll talk about different options and swaps and kind of saying. And then we're adding in lifestyle things, you know, to support the liver, to support the nervous system, you know, add in just maybe a couple things from a supplement perspective to support the body from a nutrient perspective, from, the, you know, these liver detox pathway support. That's really our first step. And, and the goal here is to kind of a couple of things. One, how do we give the body some more nutrients that it needs right off the bat? Because that's going to be not stressful. If the body has more nutrients that it needs, specifically if you've got ever growth issues, you're you're going to have nutrient defi- deficiencies. By the way, most of us have nutrient deficiencies if we're not staying on top of them. It's very hard to get all of the nutrients you need from food. It's very, very challenging. So how can we add in more nutrients? And then how can we add in things that are going to reduce stress? Like castor oil packs for the liver or a bath or a five-minute meditation a day or some breath work. You know, these things that are designed to help relieve stress and decrease stress inside the body. Yeah, and that's going to be... So the last step of these five R's is rebalance. And really everything that Megan just talked about falls under that rebalancing mark. And we kind of do this like right up front. Like we want to get you on the path of the mindfulness work. You know, what can we do extra things to help support your liver, your gallbladder, all that stuff. Just like lifestyle habits, we're doing that right away. So that's kind of a shift here. Whereas in the five R's, that's the last portion. We're more so doing that right up front. And if someone needs, like if someone's coming to us with maybe they're dealing with some really strong like autoimmune issues or they have like a really big thing going on, um, you know, for example, like like arthritis, some form of arthritis or something, we we may consider eliminating some of the bigger allergens like gluten in dairy if they're open to it, if they feel comfortable with it. Not everyone does it because it does add a a mental stress on your body trying to reduce all these things. So, you know, it's something that we are familiar with. We do it with certain people, but we certainly don't do it with every single person. No, and it's also a way to symptom manage you. It mm-hmm. is needed. You know, I, I would say, you know, yeah, definitely like some autoimmune stuff. The biggest thing that comes up for me is you know, clients with pretty significant mold toxicity and mold illness. 
who are having significant histamine and or mast cell issues, we may talk about, hey, we may want to go uh, on a lower histamine and or a lower oxalate diet, not a full-blown low histamine or low oxalate diet, and definitely not both together because that's way too intense. And I know a lot of practitioners do that. If, if we need to manage some symptoms, you know, if you're sneezing every time you eat and break out in rashes every time you eat, which yes, we do absolutely see that. Yeah, this, <laughs> is, this is a case where, hey, we're going to add in a supplement and we need to, to dial back your nutrition just a little bit so that you can live a more normal and functional life. Once again, Mm -hmm. someone's own mental and emotional health plays a really big role in this. And if they are mentally and emotionally in a good enough place to do these types of elimination diets, yeah, we will absolutely do that. But once again, that plays a really big role. These also, most of these quote unquote therapeutic diets, elimination style diets, are a way to manage symptoms. Low FODMAP plastic. It is a way to manage quote unquote IBS, which is almost always SIBO. Uh, So, but all you're doing with that is letting the bacteria go into fighting because you're not feeding them anymore. They're going to hide behind biofilms and medication is not going to cut it. Good luck with supplements too, because they're, you're never going to get them all. So this is why this is such an important piece of this. You know, the rebalancing piece, you know, one thing I noticed, you know, I've, I've been in the health and wellness industry for about 10 years, almost 10 years now. And one of the biggest mistakes that I was seeing, and, and I am guilty of this. I have not always done this in my career. And I have learned the hard way that how important this is. And when we work with a client, our goal is not only to help them heal, which, yes, that's a huge part of it. It's really about the longevity of their overall health. And most of the lifestyle things, habits, nutritional things that we recommend are not only going to be beneficial in their healing journey, but more importantly for us, they are going to be super valuable lifelong skills. You know, protein, there's a big... There's a study that's recirculating right now, and I don't know why it's all of a sudden recirculating. It's a study from like 2004, I think it is, about, you know, when people start turning 30, you know, we lose 3 to 8% of, you know, muscle mass every decade. And then protein, a higher protein diet is the way to combat that. Once again, I'm not sure why this study is all of a sudden coming back around. A good study, for sure. Yeah. 20 years old. Uh, it's still its value. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And I don't, yeah, once again, I still don't know why it's recirculating <laughs> now. But yeah, you know, we put a huge emphasis on protein because we know most people don't eat enough protein. Protein's also very balancing for blood sugar. It has a lot of nutrients. It helps stimulate stomach acid. You know, all of these things, there's a lot of reasons. And it's going to help as we age. A higher protein diet is generally recommended to help prevent, especially in women, osteoporosis, osteopenia, you know, low muscle mass, low bone density issues, all of these types of things. So why would we not try and incorporate that now? Because it's also going to be beneficial in someone's healing journey. So, you know, just these things overall, you know, having a a daily mindfulness practice. Who is that not going to benefit? (laughs) It's such a good idea for everyone. And if someone can be working with us and talking to us on a very regular basis and the accountability piece, why would we not start that right away so that they get really in the habit? And so by the time that they're done working with us, I mean, they've been doing it every day for months and months and months. The likelihood of them being able to stick with that long term goes up drastically. And this is a big reason why we incorporate, you know, chewing your food, taking a few big, big deep breaths before you eat, not chugging water while you're eating. All of these things have so much value long term and once again, it's not about doing all of these things all at once, but if we can start these pretty early on and they're getting accountability with us as they're doing it, the likelihood of those habits sticking around long term uh, goes up so, so, so much. Yeah. And this kind of goes into the next two. So the next two on the list are replace and re-inoculate. So ideally, we're not doing this until until we've done all the killing and got the big stuff out. 
However, these things that Megan are talking about, they are helping support digestion right up front. If we can get you to stop chugging water around meals, to slow down, take a couple deep breaths, to check in with yourself, those two things right there are going to help you digest your food. So that that takes away us needing to potentially add in another supplement. I mean, our goal is always to to keep you on the least amount of supplements as we can. In that right there, like those are two things that can really help with digestion support. So, you know, we're still we're still doing these things. It just looks like slightly different than this order typically than the order shows. With that being said, if someone is coming to us, you know, we see both things. Honestly, we see people who have a really desperate need for HCL support. Maybe they're struggling with like acid reflux all the time. Maybe they're taking PPIs to help prevent the acid reflux, quote unquote. Um, if that's the case, all of these people are going to, they're going to have different protocols. Sometimes we need to do some soothing beforehand. Well, you know, we might use different supplements. Uh, we might incorporate different teas or aloe juice. It's different for each person, honestly. Some people, when they start to go through the drainage support right in the beginning, they see changes and shifts. And we don't need to add in other supplements to help with enzymes and HCL. We actually can wait until the end to do that when we start to add in like the probiotics and the prebiotics to to fully rebuild the gut and protect yourself again. So it just looks so different for each person. I mean, now that I'm looking at this list, I'm like, there's no way that we could ever go down and follow each step for each person because it's just so different for everyone. Yeah, exactly. And... I I just we we often see people come to us as a more of a last resort. And I'm not saying that some people don't find us as a first resort, which we're so happy when they do, and we're so happy that yeah. they haven't, you know, if they find us first and haven't had to spend so much money on testing, on supplements, on you know, meeting with a practitioner once a month and paying, you know, like four or five hundred dollars to see someone for ten or fifteen minutes and it's basically western medicine except they're looking at a little bit few few extra things uh that western medicine won't look at and and this is a big reason why and you know once again like all of the nutritional things the lifestyle things that we're recommending right off the bat i mean the goal is to not be on a ton of supplements Uh, Mm -hmm. during the protocol and really the goal is at the end of the protocol really you're on one maybe two maybe have one or two extra things just on hand as an as needed kind of thing yes we do maintenance work and we have some things around that but you know you should be on supplements forever you know you should be on you shouldn't have to take enzymes forever you shouldn't have to take stomach acid support forever and if your your practitioner is saying this is a forever thing you know, I would just ask some questions as to why, Mm -hmm. you know, exceptions. If you don't have a gallbladder, yes, you will have to be on ox bile support forever because you are missing a key organ that that is needed to to store the bile that your body needs to break down things, you know, so that's an exception. But by and large, you should be able to get off you know, digestive enzymes. You know, if you go out and have a really big meal, big greasy meal, you know, if you buy and large don't eat gluten and you have something with gluten, if you buy and large don't eat dairy and you're eating a bucket of ice cream. Yeah, you know, like maybe some additional support may be necessary in those times, but by and large, you shouldn't need these things. And that's, that's a big difference in our practice, once again, of just our goal is to get you off just about everything you know multivitamins probably the biggest thing that we would recommend long term because once again it's just it's just challenging to get all of your nutrients from food and good luck if 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 you would like to do that it's a lot of work uh i take a multivitamin every single day and i base that off my blood work that i get done you know a few times a year and and, and that's that's what i judge that on uh and like we do for our kids too so but by and large, uh, yeah, you shouldn't have to be on a whole bunch of supplements long term. And if you do, I th- that's that's a really big red flag. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is a big red flag. And I've, I mean, I dealt with that when I was first starting my healing journey, just like 
And it's it's a, such a dreadful thought to think that you're going to have to take so many supplements like daily for the rest of your life. Huge, huge red flag and absolutely start to ask questions if someone is telling you that. But yeah, the the basics like like we've talked about time and time again, digestion support like HCL and enzymes, multivitamin, maybe having a binder on hand, it, not things that you're taking every day necessarily depending on the person. But those are just they're just maintenance pieces. It's how we keep ourselves feeling better and maybe not going back to where we started from. So yeah, very, very helpful tips. And yeah, we do, we really try and keep the supplements to a minimum as best as we can per person. Exactly. So the five steps here, and then I want to dive into a little bit deeper into our process here. So we have remove, replace, yeah. re-inoculate, repair, and then rebalance. Uh-huh. So the way we do things uh, is we have this. Here's what we do that has not like yeah, this, not like this. But, and we have hundreds of case studies at this point um, of our process working better. Uh, I'll just throw it out there. A slight brag here, just better. So, you know, Shannon talks through kind of this first process. So we're, we're kind of adding things. We're doing this liver support. You know, it's talking about a lot of lifestyle things from a nutritional lifestyle movement, nervous system regulation piece probably a couple supplements for for the liver detox pathway support to, to start opening up those pathways because once again we're prepping usually to go into some chilling and if you don't do the preparation work you're gonna get sick and it's not gonna feel good when things are releasing toxins releasing gases dying and uh, potentially getting stuck uh, in your body, okay. you know, making sure you're having full, complete bowel movements every single day. This is a, you know, really important part of that, that first step in that preparation piece. Then we can go into the killing piece. Uh-huh. Yep. So second, and then of course, to just to reiterate again, more of the lifestyle stuff too. We're going to talk about that up front when we start to address drainage. And then after that, which usually we spend, depends on the person, roughly a month on that part, depends on how well your body can handle it. But then we start to go into that first phase of killing where, you know, we're going to start to address some some of the bacteria, a little bit of the parasite stuff. Maybe if you have something else specific going on, that's when we're going to start to do some of the killing phases. And we usually spend... I'm, I'm going to just say two phases because it doesn't exactly equal out to like two months for everyone. It's very different on, you know, how sensitive are you to supplements? How fast can we go killing things off? So again, very, um, very different per person. Those, those next two phases, that's when the killing's happening. The, after that, we want to get more testing done to see what shows up for your body. So We've, we've talked about this before, but this work is really like peeling back the layers of an onion. So what presented itself in the beginning might not be presenting itself anymore. Like if you came in with a massive bacteria pattern, maybe you were diagnosed with SIBO, that might not be showing up anymore on your test work. And maybe we, we run some labs and now you're showing maybe you have a viral pattern or maybe there's still some parasite stuff showing up. We need to retest after doing that initial two phases of detox work to see what is presenting itself now. If anything, sometimes you're good to go and we can kind of go into the rebuilding phases. But I would say most often people's bodies are ready to work on the next thing that's that's presenting itself. Exactly. So kind of this phase two, phase three, the way I like to describe it is so say, quote unquote, phase two. And once again, this does really general because it, it doesn't stick for person to person but you know quote unquote phase two we're going to do bacteria yeast fungus and parasites in the gut and then we'll move okay. on to systemic parasites because parasites don't have to just be in the gut they can be just about anywhere else they can be in your lungs you know for women especially if you have things like pcos any sort of fibroid type issues even like endometriosis a lot of times the root cause is parasites. And so, you know, some of the work that we'll do is like, once again, systemic parasites and, and making sure we're getting parasites out from a lot of the big places, very much in your sinuses. They can be in your brain. Uh, they, they can be all over the place. And I know it's like creepy to think about, 
but that's why we that's why we do the systemic parasite work and then we're also doing you know using binders because when anything dies they're going to release things into the body we want to make sure that we're binding all them uh most people were also you know specifically with systemic parasites unless someone's presenting with mold you know, we'll often do some heavy metal work because parasites are known to, to hold on to heavy metals in particular. So we'll do some heavy metal work in there. And then this is a big difference between us and many, many other practices and, and a lot of the work that I've done. So before we will, will move on from the killing phase, we we were quiet testing. It, it is a really a non negotiable and it's just buckle, you know, whether it's through us or through through your physician. And this is to make sure your body is ready to repopulate and heal. Because if there is still stuff in there and you go and add in probiotics and prebiotics, the likelihood of you getting sick goes up. The likelihood of you having these issues come right back around goes up significantly. So our goal is not to have perfect blood work at this point. But really to see where your body is and to make sure these specific patterns are in a good enough place that we feel comfortable going in and repopulating without the immediate chance of you, one, getting sick, two, having these issues just come right back around. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's in not always blood work, too. So if you're someone who all of a sudden, like starts presenting with a handful of other issues maybe that look like similar to some mold stuff and we're not 100 percent sure and we want to be 100 percent sure before we do rebuilding we would recommend some functional testing like an oat test to to see what's showing up and i mean i have a handful of people right now you know that that's that's the path that we're on just because we when we want to get people started and they already have blood work, maybe they're not ready to spend that amount of money on testing. Maybe they didn't even know that this could potentially be an issue when we first started because that happens pretty frequently too. It's important to do that second round of testing to make sure we get everything that's going on because that's the one thing that we, have, Megan and I have both been through like all of our lives when we were trying to address the healing thing is circling back to the same thing over and over again and not getting the real root cause. So this second round of testing is really to help us make sure we got everything, we're good to go, good to move into the rebuilding. And your testing won't look perfect at this point by any means because we still need to spend the time doing a little bit of soothing, putting all the good bacteria back in there, maybe rebalancing nutrients and minerals a little bit more. And you know, if you want to to get testing after the rebuild, we love seeing that too, because it's really fun to have all three to look at and compare and see how much better they've gotten. Exactly. And yeah, it's just, it's so important that we make sure everything is cleared out because once again, Shannon and I have been through killing and rebuilding and killing and rebuilding. And every time you tell you have to rebuild and then you have to be ready to kill. And it's just, it's all quiet. It, and so we try and take that piece out of it as much as possible. So we will not reintroduce probiotics and prebiotics until we feel very, very confident that your body is ready. And this is kind of the final piece to to a lot of your gut issues in particular, to make sure that your body is ready to be repopulated, to be soothed, to heal and seal these things. And, and do kind of more of the fine tuning piece. You know, if we need to do some immune system work, you know, that can happen either before or after. It kind of it really depends on the person, what else we see going on. You know, hormone work we will do often after the rebuilding. Same thing, like if we see thyroid issues, uh, we'll do those afterwards if they're if they are still present, which often they are not. So yeah, there can be some tweaking work, but we really need to make sure the gut is like fully cleared out before we move on to kind of this last piece of and we usually break this up into two pieces it depends on the person a little bit but you know the first part is you know that that rebuilding uh so probiotics reintroducing good bacteria and then more importantly than the probiotics is feeding the good stuff so we put a heavier emphasis on prebiotics than we do probiotics okay. yes you will we put everyone on a probiotic of some sort at least one maybe two depending on the person and 
and kind of what we've been going through, but almost everyone's on two prebiotics and, and staying on the prebiotics longer to make sure that we're really feeding and repopulating the good stuff that we want there that's going to really help keep the body rebound. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then this is where during this rebuilding phase, we're also going to add in some HCL enzyme blend to start rebuilding the stomach acid because that's also a very important piece to make sure, you know, where your body is able to protect itself from, from pathogens, especially being exposed to that we're exposed to through food and whatnot. It's so important to have adequate stomach acid levels. So this is also the time where we're going to start to rebalance and add supplements in to help with that. Exactly. And then kind of the last piece that we'll do, uh, you know, with the gut in particular, it's heal and seal the small intestinal lining. So that's a, this is finally where we get to addressing the leaky gut because it doesn't matter until this point. You know, you can't, mm-hmm. you know, L-glutamine, aloe, marshmallow root, you know, some of these common ones, we have a particular... uh one that we prefer, GI Revive, which is a, a very good and very comprehensive blend of a okay. lot of these nutrients. You know, you can just use L-glutamine. You know, our thing is, is if if we've done all of this work, we want the best and most comprehensive way to re rebalance and then heal and seal the gut lining. You know, same thing with the stomach acid. You know, kind of depends on the person whether we're going to use like an enzyme blend or just like straight up. Um, stomach acid support, uh, you know, if we need continued like bio support, you know, we'll look at all of that because it, re- it really does vary so much person to person. And once again, we've incorporated and recommended all of these lifestyle things to to hopefully prevent the need for these things. And for some people, it is still necessary. And that is okay. And, and once again, it should be a short term thing, not a long term thing. You know, p- people shouldn't be on any of these supplements for long term. Uh, we're not big believers in that you should be on a probiotic forever. Um, you know, okay. eating probiotic and prebiotic rich foods, super great, super okay. important. You know, and this is where we'll start having that conversation of, okay, let's reintroduce a lot of these foods. Like, how can we get more of this? And, you know, if you can't, if you're not open to the food piece, you know, we may recommend a supplement, not forever, but to have as a maintenance piece of this. Um, but really, our goal at this point is, okay, when can we start getting off with some supplements here? What does this look like long term? How can we do as much through nutrition and lifestyle that we can and that and that the person is open to? Because that also plays a really big role. Uh, you know, for me, like the thought of eating sauerkraut, just like, absolutely not. I in no way will I ever eat sauerkraut. Like, I love it. So gross. That I way. eat it like every day. Oh my gosh. No, that's great. But, but I will eat yogurt and I do like, you know, certain kombuchas and, and things like that, uh, which, which are probiotic rich foods. But so, you know, it, it, it does very, very person to person. Cabbage, cabbage, and I just don't. No, thank you. I have no interest. I will eat Brussels sprouts, uh, but, but actual cabbage, absolutely not. It's so funny because Rob calls it, um, he always says sauerkraut smells like sweaty feet or tastes like sweaty feet. And I'm like, oh my God, I love it. Like kimchi, sauerkraut, all of those are really good with, you know, probiotics for the gut. So is kombucha Mm -hmm. too. And that's an easy one because kombucha is almost like, it's like a sweet, refreshing drink. So I don't really know anyone who doesn't like kombucha, honestly. Yeah. And the only people I know are people who have gut overgrowth issues and haven't addressed them yet because they get bloated when they drink it. Yes. 100%. Yeah. If you have any kind of like, you know, borderline histamine, mast cell, any mold stuff, like bacteria stuff, you typically would want to try and stay away from some of these fermented foods because you're probably not going to feel the best when you eat them until you can resolve it. But yeah, those are the main things during the rebuilding phase. And then every now and then we will sometimes, if someone is dealing with some extra like inflammation stuff, maybe they're still lingering with some joint pain or something, we might add in something to help with inflammation, like a curcumin supplement. Sometimes it's CBD. It really depends on the person. But that 
And sometimes if it's needed, maybe earlier throughout the protocol, but by and large, we're typically adding it in during that last phase as well. Yeah, exactly. And gut inflammation is really common if you have gut overgrowth issues, if, you know, that, that it, you know, leaky gut intestinal permeability, which if you have an overgrowth issue, like you're going to have that kind of stuff. So, um, yeah. And at this point, you know, if someone has previously had some pretty significant food reactions, you know, we will definitely reintroduce all of those. Um, and, and most people will heal from their food intolerances or food sensitivities. I will say just the two exceptions can, and this is not the case for everyone, would be gluten. And, and a lot, a lot of times it'll just be the quality of the gluten. You know, most people will do okay yeah. with like a sourdough type bread, something fresh, something that isn't super processed. Um, I am not one of those people. I have chosen to stay strictly, extremely gluten free. I I just noticed such a difference, even with good quality gluten. I just I I still mildly react, and it's not it's not worth it to me. And, and same thing with dairy. You know, sometimes dairy people will continue will will continue to not do well with that. Once again, the quality really matters. You know, someone may do well with a whole milk, a raw milk, raw dairy. Uh, goat or sheep's milk based dairy products. You know, I, for me, I've been lactose intolerant my entire life. I was in elementary school, then I stopped eating dairy. So it, for me, that was never a big deal. I'll, I'll certainly eat cheese here and there, uh, particularly goat and sheep's milk based cheese. And I do just fine with that. But it, when I get into whole, even raw, raw dairy, I still just don't, don't feel the. Yeah. It's very different per person. I mean, I'm kind of on the same boat. Like I can tolerate sheep, goat's milk. I would like to try like raw, raw cow's milk products again at some point. I don't think I'm there quite yet. But for the most part, yeah, I mean, it's it's very per person. Some people are like, yeah, I'm ready to let this go. Like I know that this is bothering me. Other people, there's the the attachment to it that causes more stress. So it just really depends on how strong your issues are and what you're dealing with. But during the the ending rebuilding phases is that is when we would try and add some of that stuff back in if that's what you're feeling like you're ready to do. Exactly. I also just want to mention that because I feel like this comes up a lot at the end of hey, you know, when I eat, I'm gonna, I'm going to give a really really intense example here. When I McDonald's, I have to. I have to run to the restroom pretty immediately. And and here's the thing, you know, and we can, I mean, we can throw bread in there. We can throw pasta in there. You may find you react to heavily processed foods. And I also just want to say most people react to heavily processed foods, except they're not aware of it. And when you're so used to feeling bad, eating something that makes you feel bad almost doesn't impact you because you're so used to that feeling that it doesn't even matter. You know, that's a big thing for me, you know, why I really don't drink alcohol very much anymore. I mean, it's been almost a year at this point since I've had my last drink. And and that's because I just, I know how good I feel when I have a good night's sleep and you know and I have time to like prepare and go to bed and and I wake up and have my morning routine and my brain is in a good spot and I you know I'm able to do all these things and when I'm drinking even if it is one drink my sleep's going to be impacted I probably didn't do the same kind of evening routine that we usually do and I'm going to probably wake up with a little bit of a headache I'm going to feel dehydrated and my body's just not going to feel great. And the the rest of my day isn't going to be as good as I know it can be if I did not have those one to two drinks that I may have chosen to enjoy. And that is a choice that I will choose at times knowing what the consequences will be. And it depends on the situation. You know, if they're, you know, for me, for going out to a really nice meal and having, you know, cocktail for me, that looks like an old fiction. Just I I actually genuinely like the taste of most alcohol. I, you know, I love red wine, um, yeah. tequila, bourbon, whiskey, mead. I you know I'm a huge fan. Just the taste, it, it's yeah. very very good for me. 
And, but I choose not to do that because I, once again, I just have the consequences. And, you know, if I'm going to go out to a nice meal and I don't have a lot going on the next day. I might choose to have a drink. And once again, I just know the consequences. Same thing, like a bowl uh-huh. of pasta. Yeah, that can be feel amazing. And there's so much emotional value in that for some people. And if you're okay with the consequences, that's okay. That is your choice. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I'm the same way. And I'm I'm so glad you brought that up too, because it it's just so different. There's so many things that play a part in that too. But I feel like and I just had this happen with someone where they ate something that they hadn't ate since we started the program and they got all these bad reactions from it and they were like do you think it's like you know this specific thing or this specific thing and we had to like stop and explain this whole thing be like listen this is a really processed food that you haven't had in a while it doesn't mean that you're like you have this major allergy to it maybe your body just doesn't prefer to eat this on a regular basis so and you know same thing with the alcohol thing i'm very much like i i I certainly still drink, but the the environment, what I'm doing the next day, the energy around the situation all has to be in a pretty good spot. And if not, I'm probably going to say no and not do it anyway, because I'm the same way. Like, it's not worth. Does the benefit outweigh the risk kind of situation? Like, how awful am I going to feel the next day? So there's there's certainly multiple things that we need to think about and hate to break it to people, but you know, fast food, like there's just so many added things in there. It's hard for me to even call it like real food. So it just depends on how you look at it. And when you start to go through something like our program and make these changes, we talk about more food quality, sometimes at the beginning, more so at the end when we get like more in depth with it. But when you start to make those changes, most likely you're instantly going to notice a difference in energy levels and how you feel. And then when you try to add that stuff back in, you're going to notice it right away, how it affects your body, how it makes you feel. So yeah, just something to pay attention to. Yeah. And it's choices. You, I mean, it's your life It's and it's your choices yeah. and it's, uh, mm-hmm. you know, what? there's no right or wrong way. It's just how you would choose to live your life. And, you know, for us, like by and large, we're going to make the decisions to eat pretty clean because we know how good we can feel and we know what some of these other foods don't make us feel very good and we we don't want to feel that way so yeah there, there's often choices that that our people are making towards the end and you know just the other thing i'll just kind of to wrap up here you know that i'll throw in here is you know when for example for me when my stress is really high I am going to choose to eat a little bit differently than when I am not very stressed. Because as as we've talked about, to nauseam probably at this point, the nervous system makes a big difference in how you digest food. So, you know, if, if I'm under a lot of stress, I, I am going to probably try at least do my best to very, very, very much reduce any processed food and really focus on whole clean proteins and really good veggies and some like starchier carbs that are, you know, like vegetable based oftentimes when many people, when they are stressed might make the opposite choice and, and eat a little bit more processed type foods. And, and I know timing is a factor here. And if you're very stressed, you may have less time, but these are all things that I very much think about when my stress is higher, because I know my digestion can be impacted and I'm just going to make, be conscious and aware of that and, and do my best to continue to feel as good as I can. And that's just one aspect of it. Yeah. And that, and it's, this certainly doesn't mean like, I, this is just coming to mind. So I want to add it in because a lot of people think that when we're talking about, generally, I don't like using the word like clean food. I, Megan, I know you don't either. But sometimes it just it is what it is. We have to describe it some way. So that's our choice. But when it comes to like raw veggies and stuff, you know, that kind of falls into something where it's a little bit iffy because when we're when our digestion is struggling, we're really not going to be able to break down something like raw veggies. So you kind of have to get to know your body and know yourself. And there's an energy piece to it too. Certainly when I'm feeling stressed or 
a certain way. I naturally want more comforting foods like warm, soft, maybe some starchier stuff like potatoes. It really looks different for everyone. But if you can, and it will most likely be difficult in some aspect, putting the the more the better quality food in your body is only going to help in the long run, especially when it comes to the digestion factor. Yeah, exactly. So that's gut health. Part two, you know, we can probably do a part three just because there's so much that goes into gut health. But thank you for sticking uh, around with us. We hope you learned a ton, especially between these two episodes. This is one of our all-time favorite topics because gut health is so important and we just see it done not great. Uh, it's the word I will uh, phrase I will use uh, when it comes to this. So thank you for joining us. Um, as always, like, subscribe, follow. Uh, if it resonates, a five star review. All of that stuff really, really, really means the world to us, and we really appreciate being all of that. And thanks for joining us, and we will see you next time.